Thanks, Becky. Awesome. Appreciate you. Some great opportunities to pray as a family. And that's kind of always our default position to be in, prayer. We need something? Let's go to prayer. We're hurting? Let's go to prayer. We're celebrating? Let's go to prayer. And so avail yourself of those opportunities every third Sunday night and every Sunday morning at 9. And uh, it's really a powerful time. So uh, you are invited. Consider this your own very personal invitation right now. So cool. It's good to have you here today. It's good to be here, isn't it? Yeah, cool. Awesome. Well, hey, so we're in this series, Kingdom Come, Embracing the Power of God. But before we get started today, uh, I, I have a little uh, prayer request. And so these are 10 people, three ad adults and, and seven teenagers who spent the night with us Friday night into Saturday. They're from the Vineyard Church in Duluth, Minnesota. They're on their way to Philippi, West Virginia and needed a place to stay. And so they came and they stayed with us. And I told them, you know what? We will be praying for you on Sunday. They're going to work with the Convoy of Hope and rebuilding some homes and doing some things for some people who are in uh, some serious need. And so uh, really great teenagers, great leaders. We had a, a blast yesterday as uh, we kind of sat around a breakfast table and talked and prayed together. And it's just great that the... I, you know, the church as a whole, we're, we're all the same church. You know, it's all the big C church, the church of Jesus Christ, the body of Christ. And, and this is a member of our tribe, the vineyard, you know? And so it's, uh, it's just very cool. And so, Lord, we just come, we ask right now in the name of Jesus, that you would be on these youth and these adults in Philippi, West Virginia. Right now, Lord God, give them strength and endurance to do the task at hand. Bless the work of their hands, Lord Jesus, that they would be salt and light to the community in which they're ministering, Father God. Lord, we come uh, against any, uh, any schemes of the enemy, any fear, any anxiety that any of these guys have, and just pray your power over them in the name of Jesus. Amen. I had to pray that last part because I was talking to the, one, of, one of these uh, students, and he said, man, this is the first time I've ever been away from home for more than just a couple days without my parents. That's a big thing, right? So uh, continue to pray for them this week. They'll be coming back through here on Friday on their way back home and, uh, and spending the night again here Friday night. So if you think about it, just, just be praying for them. So anyway, all right, well, again, kingdom come, embracing the power of God. Last week, we uh, over these past weeks, we've been talking about kingdom theology, the belief that the not yet, the incredible power and beauty of God's future heaven has broken into the now through the love of Christ and the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. We learned uh, that the not yet should continually to invade our now, our everyday lives, influencing our every decision, our every action. The, in other words, the, the things of God are what are driving us. Not the things of today, not the things that surround us. If we get wrapped up on what we see in TV and on social media, our brains will explode. And it leads to fear and anxiety. Why not rest on the word of God and what he's doing in our lives? Because that leads to peace, to contentment, to goodness. God is good. The overarching theme verse for this series is 1 Corinthians 4.20. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. The kingdom of God is not just something to talk about. It is something to talk about, but not just something to talk about. It's not about, you know, just doing this and this, but it's a matter of power. It's a matter of acting in those powers and doing those things that God's calling us to do. And then receiving. We need to remember to do that sometimes. Sometimes we think we're not just worthy of it, or I didn't really earn it, or I'm not good enough. But God promised all kinds of wonderful things for his children. Are we willing to just receive them for what it is? Not feeling like we have to earn them or feel ashamed that we didn't earn them, but just receive the gift because he's God and he wants to give good gifts to us. Sometimes that's hard for us to do, isn't it? Just to receive blessings without doing anything to earn them. Well, this week, we're going to look at the sovereignty of the king, because God is called the king of kings, the Lord of lords. 
We're going to look at his authority, his dominion over everything on heaven, uh, in heaven and on earth. Because here's the thing. We're going, yeah, I, I really want to embrace the power of God. I really want to live for him. Right, but how can we do that if we're not going to understand that we're under his authority? How do we live in the kingdom if we don't understand the king? And so over these first couple of weeks, we're just kind of hitting some of the basics so that we next, uh, the next few weeks are just really in how we dig into that power, how we plug into the source. Let's pray real quick and just give this time. Lord, open our, our hearts to receive what you would give us. Open our ears to hear and understand what you want to say through your word today. We want to know you more, Lord. We want to know you more. We want to experience you more. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, when we talk about the sovereignty of, king, of the king, it's a little difficult for most Americans to really fully grasp what that means since we don't live in a, a nation governed by a monarchy, right? We're just not that familiar. And when we think about uh, a, a kingdom, we usually think about kind of castles like the ones that are up here on the right-hand side, these old medieval-style castles that had kings or queens or whoever the monarch was that was terrifying. They were evil, some of them, who extorted their people through taxes and brutality. Do it my way or we're just going to take your head off. It's a good incentive. But it really skews what our, our mind of a kingdom can be. And God's kingdom is nothing like that. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. It's giving. It's amazing. We'll talk about that today. Now, part of living in the kingdom is receiving the provision of the king, his mercy, his grace, his blessing, his protection in the walls of the kingdom. But we need to understand that also uh, it's more than just provision. It's, it's, it's his lordship that we signed up for. The, well, Lord, if you tell me to do it, I'll do it. Well, that's a scary prayer, isn't it? We sing a song that says, if you lead me, Lord, I will follow. There's, a, there's another scary prayer. If you're ready to follow, because he'll take you up on it, won't he? That's <laughs> so today we're going to look at three things that have to do with the sovereignty uh, of the king. The first is uh, provision, which we all love God's provision right? Uh, the second is providence, which those two get mixed up sometimes, though they're very similar. And the third is sovereignty, all right? So let's start with this word provision. God meets our needs. In other words, God provides, simply put. He sometimes even meets some of our wants, some of our desires, and I love that about him. And the thing to understand about a kingdom is that a good king provides for the people of his kingdom. A good king will provide. Philippians 4, 19 says, and my God will meet your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah, right? What a great promise of the Lord. But notice that Paul writes in here, he meets our needs, not our wants, not our everyday whims, Although God is pretty faithful and gives us a lot of those sometimes too. And it's always according to the riches of his glory, not our glory. It's all for, for him. We don't get to pick and choose. But he is a good God and he will provide. He always provides. When Don and I were, were first married, man, we were just like, poor, out-of-college kids. I, we lived in a house. I bought my first house. It was $38,000, a little tiny, like 945-square-foot, two-bedroom house on a matchbox, you know, size piece of land. Not necessarily the, the best neighborhood in town in Cincinnati. But, it was, you know, God provided. And, and, and we didn't have a lot of money. We had debt. We had student debt. And we ate a lot of PB&J. We ate a lot of raw men. But the cool thing is, we had this box of cereal, this box of Cheerios. In fact, it wasn't even Cheerios. It was Kroger Toastios, right? We didn't, didn't even have the, you know, the name brand. And that thing lasted for weeks. We just kept pouring out of it. 
It was amazing. It was a total loaves and fishes thing. I'm not exaggerating. It wasn't like we all had little bowls like this either. We kept pouring out of it. God kept providing right when we needed it. It was amazing. He knew exactly uh, what we needed, and he was so good to us and provided. The other thing is God provides uh, not just so we have what we need, but so that he can glorify himself in us and through us. We'll tell that story any day. Because I want to know how, how people, I want people to know how good our God is. And how good he can be to you too. I want people to know that. I want to give him the glory. That wasn't me making the Cheerios appear. 2 Corinthians 9, 8 tells us this. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. We receive what we need to do his work, to do the good work of God, not always what we want. And a lot of times, it's not always material things. And we'll talk about that in just a minute, too. But we need to realize that it's only when our spiritual eyes are open that we can see and understand God's provision. Well, he didn't give me that. No, but he gave you what you needed. Well, I really wanted this, but did he give you this? We get so focused on what he doesn't give us that we forget to look at what he does give us, his generosity. Ephesians 1, 18, Paul is is talking to the church in Ephesus, and this is his prayer for them. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his un- incomparably great power for us who believe. It's not always material possessions that he provides. It's these other things, things like grace and love the riches of his inheritance. We're the people of God. So if you're not seeing God's provision in your life, are you willing to ask, hey God, open open my eyes that I would see what you're doing in my life today. And then give him glory for it. Thank you, Lord. When was the last time you really just sat down and said, thank you, God, for, and just started listing everything he's been good, so good to you. When was the last time you just listed off the things that you're thankful for, God? It's not just for Thanksgiving around the table, right? We can do that any day. God is God is good. All right, so that's provision. The next word is providence, which is a very similar. And this is that God provides our needs sometimes before uh, we even have them. He's preparing us for the need. In some ways, a good king understands the needs of his people even when they don't. Sometimes we just don't know what we need. Anybody relate to that? There are a lot of times I just don't realize that I need it. And this divine providence is God foreseeing and protecting and providing in a manifest way with care and guidance. That providence, that divine providence, Providence, I love that. So not only does uh, he provide things before we need him, a lot of times he provides things without even us knowing. I think we're going get to the, get to heaven and we're going to sit down and maybe God will give us a little flashback of our life. And he's going, and I was there, and I was there, and I was there, and I was there. And we're going to go, no way. How many times have we looked back on things and going, man, I, I, I didn't see it then. But looking back, man, I see God all over me right there. I see the Holy Spirit moving in me all the time right there. Just through not only those gifts, but guidance and through circumstances. I'm going to give you another example out of my own life about God's providence. So Don and I were out in Colorado visiting friends. We decided we'd like to go up and visit my niece, who was a little north of Denver, and we had rented a car. So we go to get our car, and it's supposed to be this little tiny key hatchback, right? And, uh, and so we're going to be driving through the mountains and, and that and seeing people. And, and the guy at the counter said, hey, look, I had this Ford Explorer just come in. It's loaded. It's nice. got the four doors, all this stuff. And, and if you'd like, I'll give it to you for the same price. I'm like, yeah, 
Well, first, actually, my brain goes to, I wonder how many miles to the gallon that gets, because we are going to do a lot of driving, right? And I thought, no, this is God providing. And so we took him up on it. And a few days later, we were up visiting my, my niece, and on our way back down into Denver, we come to one of those wonderful roundabouts that we all just love. And as we're coming up to it, a semi is coming through, so we, we wait for, for him to pass, her to pass, whichever, and the guy behind me just doesn't even apply the brakes and just slams right into the back of us, and it pushes us right beyond the truck. It had just passed. I mean, we missed it by inches. God was all over us that day. I'm still getting like the willies thinking about it. His car looked like an accordion that was dripping all sorts of fluid, and the horn was stuck on, of course. Our car had a little dent in the back bumper. No one was hurt. Donna, myself, the guy in the other car. And that was God just providing before we ever even knew we would need it. So other than about an hour of, of dealing with this and, and meeting with the police and, and, and filing a claim with our insurance and calling the rental place, other than an hour out of our vacation, nothing else happened. How good is our God? And we knew it, man. We were, come on, Lord. Paul writes to the church in Galatia. He says this, before, uh, but even before I was born, God chose me and called me by his marvelous grace. If you get nothing else from today, please remember that. Galatians 1, 15, go home, write it down, put it on, on your wherever, your computer, your refrigerator, your dashboard, wherever you're going to see this. And say that to yourself. Before I was even born, God chose me and called me by his marvelous grace because that's something we all can claim in the name of Jesus. And that's something we need to remind ourselves of daily. You were called. You are claimed by God. One of my favorite stories of God's Providence comes from 1 Samuel 17, verses 32 through 36. This is David getting prepared to fight Goliath, right? Now, the story of David and Goliath is amazing, but this little preparation moment is so important because he's being questioned by King Saul about his qualification as a teenage shepherd boy. So this is what he says. Don't worry about the Philistine, David told Saul. I'll go fight him. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You are only a boy, and he's been, and he's a, a man of war since his youth. But David persisted. I have been taking care of my father's sheep and goats, he said. When a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club, and I rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw, and I club it to death. I have done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too, for he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. The thing is, he knew where his strength came from. And it was nothing about him. But here's the thing, if we look at this in the idea of providence, as a shepherd boy, God was preparing David to defeat Goliath, to protect his people, because he was already taught how to defeat bears and lions, to protect his sheep and goats. He was preparing David to be a great psalmist because David would spend those long afternoons and evenings on the plains with the sheep, playing his harp and singing praises to God. And he was preparing David to be king, not because of anything else he could do, but because his faith was in God and God alone, the king of kings. God's providence with David was powerful. It was powerful. His presence was amazing, and he formed this young shepherd boy into a great ruler through his great providence. And he does the same for us today. 
right here, right now. And all we have to do is say, open the eyes of my heart that I would see you, Lord. And finally, sovereignty. So, so provision, providence, all about what God does for us. But then there comes a point where we need to acknowledge his lordship over our life. That he is the king. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the ultimate singular authority. A good king is sovereign. He looks after the needs and the concerns of his people, even if that means withholding things and saying no. God gives and he takes away. As a parent and as a grandparent, you've probably taken things away from your children, haven't you? We don't like to hear that he gives and takes away because we don't think, well, my God loves me. He wouldn't take anything away. Let me tell you what, if you're standing in front of a bus coming at you at about 60 miles per hour, I hope someone takes that away from me. Right? He loves us enough to take away the good so he can give you his best. And he never just simply takes away. He never just says no. He says no and then provides a great yes right after it. He loves us enough to say no. Understanding the difference. Now, here's the thing. Some people say, well, isn't like a, a, a king, isn't that like a dictator? You know, they, they can say whatever they want, do whatever they want. And there is a difference between a sovereign and a dictator because a dictator is, is usually just one person who, who's leading, but they're doing it for their sake of their own profit and power. It's all about them, right? It's my power. It's my profit. I'm going to I'm going to tax these people up to here like they did in the old days, right? In these medieval times, the king would just tax people into submission. They would create fear. But a true sovereign has his or her people's best interest in mind. What they do, they do for the good of their people. We need to understand this because Again, in America, we're just, the idea of a sovereignty just doesn't seem to really work in our idea of, of ruling and politics and that. R.C. Sproul, famous theologian, wrote in his book, Following Christ, the concept of lordship or sovereignty invested in one individual is repugnant to the American tradition. Yet, this is the boldness of the claim of the New Testament for Jesus that absolute sovereign authority and imperial power are vested in Christ. And I'll add one word to the end of that, if you don't mind, R.C. Christ alone. No one else gets sovereignty. It is the king only who has sovereignty. God's sovereignty is simply explained, if you need something real easy, God is in control. We've all saw, said the song, you know, sung the song, God is in control. We have the bumper stickers. And, and a lot of people think this is not good, but what we mean here, it's not that God is controlling. It's not that he's manipulating or micromanaging our lives. We still have free will. We, we have the right to do what we want, even if we mess up sometimes. But we understand that nothing is outside of his scope. There's nothing that gets by him. He knows all, sees all. He is over all. And everything, everything is his. Colossians 1, 15 and 17, God created everything. Let's look at this. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authority, all things have been created through him and for him. Hear that. They're not ours. They were created through him and they're created for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. Everything says we are simply stewards. And that's pretty cool. We get to use the king's stuff. We get to do the king's stuff. And that's really awesome. God is good. Now, if we think about it, even our salvation, our faith is God's sovereign gift to us. Really? Yeah. Yeah, Jesus even said, no one comes to me unless the Father has enabled them. Right? 
In Ephesians 2a, we're told that salvation is not from us, but is a gift from God. And even in the Old Testament, Jonah chapter 2 verse 9 tells us salvation is from the Lord alone. Our salvation is a, is a beautiful, wonderful gift from our sovereign king. So let's be real here, guys. Let's get down to it. Why is it so hard for us to understand and accept God's sovereignty? Why? And, and I'm going to start with one word here, control. We don't like giving up control, do we? We like to be in control, or at least think we are. Why? Well, that leads us to number two, fear. We are so afraid that things are going to spin out of control. It's not easy to let someone rule your life, especially someone you can't see or hear or touch. We get afraid of it. We get afraid of life and what it sends us. And then this leads us to the third thing, which is distrust. Can I really trust God? Does he really know what's going on? And that leads us then to, to pride, which is, yeah, I'm, not, you know, I'm not sure if you, I'll just go ahead and do it myself because I probably know what's best for me. And that's an ugly path to, to go down. When we start grabbing control from a sovereign God, that can lead to some serious, serious damage uh, for ourselves. So here's the big thing. If God is sovereign, if he's in control and he is a good God, you ready for this one? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. God is the perfect example of a righteous king. Let me add that for sure. I don't want to pass that by. Before we get to the big question, if God is sovereign, if he's in control, if he's a good God, then why doesn't God do something about all the bad stuff happening in the world? Why didn't he just come down and do something about all those bad things going on? If he's sovereign, if he can give, if he can take away. And here's the thing, even though everything belongs to God, he gives us free will. Everybody free will, even the sinners. We have the right to choose, and sinful people do sinful things that affect and even hurt others. Unfortunately, we're a victim of a sinful world a lot of times. But here's the good news. God's got us. He knows that what we're going through, he knows that there are sinful people out there that will affect us, that will hurt us that will create circumstances that will bring us down and bring us into times of adversity, but we never go through it alone. When we know Jesus is our Savior and Lord, we're never alone. We talk about that a lot here. And when the enemy tries to destroy it, God will always turn it around for his good. And so let me give you four advantages of living uh, in the kingdom, four advantages of giving ourselves over to the sovereignty, the providence and provision of the Lord, our King. And the first thing is freedom. We get freedom when we live in God's kingdom. There's a freedom of handing all our stuff over to the divine expert, and that's what God is. He's the expert in everything, and we can just give him everything we're going through and anything. Take it, Lord. Give me guidance in it. It's yours. Relieve this of me. And if you've ever owned a business, you know how good it is to have someone you can trust handle your books. I'm going to give that over to someone. Or better yet, if you've ever owned your own business, you know how stressful it is. Sometimes just to go work for someone is just really nice to have and let them make all the tough decisions. There's a freedom in letting go, which then brings peace when you know someone else is responsible. It's like driving in a, an unknown place or in an unknown land. Maybe you've been to England or Scotland or one of those places they drive on the, the wrong side or the, what we call the left side of the road. It's nice to be there and have someone who's used to driving on the left side and you can just be a passenger and let them take you wherever. There's a peace in that. You're not all tensed up wondering if, you know, all right. And this leads us to contentment. God gives me exactly what I need when I need it. When we believe that, when we embrace that, we become so content. We don't have to hunt for it. We don't have to fight for it. It doesn't consume us. We just allow God to provide, to be in control, knowing that he has the very best for us. And that leads us to number four, that our good is replaced with his great. 
When we live in the kingdom of God, the stuff that we do that we think is good is replaced by the stuff that we couldn't even imagine before. He does stuff for us and gives us such great blessings. We start doing things that are like, man, I've never thought I could ever do that before. Or I've never thought I'd ever have that before. And this is not a prosperity uh, teaching, guys. This is, sometimes it could just be some of the most simple things. This doesn't always mean material things. Sometimes he'll lift up a talent in you. Sometimes all of a sudden you're praying for people and things are happening. When you are released and you become content and our good is replaced with his great. And you ready for this? Here's the big point to learn today. We can only find our role in the kingdom of God by submitting ourselves to God's authority, to his sovereignty. We won't find it until we do. Jesus said we need to deny ourselves, pick up our cross daily and follow him. That we're supposed to deny ourselves. We're supposed to die to ourselves so that we can have life in him. So by surrendering to the Lord's authority, things start happening. We start giving over everything to him. Uh, Our view of God changes, not just of ourselves, but of God. We begin seeing God's loving sovereignty where once all we saw was a wrathful, controlling judge. God's so mean. Look what he did. And then all of a sudden we see this loving sovereignty come out as as our perspective, our point of view changes. By surrendering to the Lord's authority, we begin seeing God's divine providence where once we saw coincidence, wasn't that nice that kind of happened? And all of a sudden we realize God set us up for it. And then we begin seeing God's abundant provision where once we saw a need to be self-sufficient, I need to do this, I need to do this, I need to do this. And yet if I just relax and let God give me what I need and don't worry about everything I want, Trusting him, and he knows what we need better than we do. There's such a peace. There's such a freedom. There's such a contentment in that, guys. God is good. Yes, the worship team to come up. His provision, his providence guards us and provides for us even when we don't see it. He is, he is sovereign. He is king. He is worthy to be praised. And here's the thing, guys. He's not only worthy to be praised when the land is plentiful, he's worthy to be praised during the famine in the desert. We give thanks when we're blessed. We rejoice in adversity because we know that to get to the mountain, sometime we have to go through the valley. And he's always with us. He has a plan for each and every one of us. I hope you guys know that. He has a plan for you, something greater than you could even believe for yourself. And so we're going to sing a song. We're going to worship. But as you prepare to to leave from here today, I want you to know that God's got you. He's, he's, He's not only the king of kings. He's our heavenly father. He loves us so much. The king of king reigns on high, but the father draws us into his throne. Our Lord of Lord provides for us. And Jesus died for us so we could have a relationship with him. And through that, we find, we experience his freedom, his peace, his contentment, and and God's goodness as we submit to his authority. So, Father, come, have your way in us today. Lord God, we repent from the times that we grab the wheel and try to take over, the times we try to take control. Forgive us, Lord. We submit to your authority. Come and have your way in our hearts today. We want more of you. We want that peace that only comes by submitting to you. We want that freedom in our life that only comes by depending on you. We want that contentment of living in the walls of your kingdom and the love and the mercy and the grace that you share with us. We love you, God, and we glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen.